Hi, this is a video intended to help produce farmers who already use QuickBooks figure out what percentage of their sales go to consumers who are qualified end users under FSMA's produce safety rule. It might be that you don't know what that means quite yet, or that was kind of a mouthful, but um, we'll dive into it a little bit more here. I'm Elaine Lemon. I'm uh, working with the National Young Farmers Coalition to help do this video and help everybody understand how you can use QuickBooks to create this report that's going to be essential to understand your um, exemption. So Kitchen Table Consultants is, um, we're a group of business owners and farmers. Uh, we care a lot about uh, keeping farmers in, bus in business. Um, some of the things that we do uh, we, I, I'm mostly focused in the financial consulting and the education and training, but we provide services to in all different facets as far as business. We don't consult on production, um, but we do serve farmers and food artisans, um, and we work with nonprofits and also government agencies. These are our four tenets. Uh, I think my favorite is that we walked a mile in your shoes. Uh, basically, that just means like we felt some of the pain and the joys of owning businesses. And so when we work with you, we have a really clear understanding of what you're going through. It helps us to relate and it helps you to understand that we're in it with you and we're there to work side by side. Um, and I'm Kara Fravor. I'm with the National Young Farmers Coalition. Um, uh, our coalition unites young farmers and ranchers from around the country to ensure a brighter, more sustainable future for American agriculture. Um, we work, we do that by tackling critical structural and economic barriers that um, prevent motivated young people from building successful businesses. Um, you might be really familiar with a lot of those barriers like land access and access to credit, but one of the barriers um, that we're also dealing with and the one that we're talking about today is about na navigating federal rules and regulations like the Food Safety Modernization Act. You can read more about um, our coalition at youngfarmers.org and you can read more about FSMA there as well and find um, resources for learning more about uh, food safety. Um, so we are developing this video because we've spent like almost three years uh, working with the local food safety collaborative to help smaller growers understand how the Food Safety Modernization Act or FSMA will impact their businesses. And we've trained like 1,500 farmers and most of the people that we trained are considered qualified exempt. Uh, hopefully if you're watching this video, which is a little advanced, you'll know a bit about FSMA already and you'll understand qualified exemption and you're just checking in to understand how you can use QuickBooks to prove a qualified exemption. But when you're qualified exempt, one of the key things that you'll need to do is to keep records that prove that exemption. Um, so we're going to call that a qualified exempt annual review. Um, so inspections are beginning, inspections for the produce safety rule under FSMA are beginning in some states. Um, and in some of those states, small farmers are beginning to be asked to apply for a qualified exemption or to prove their qualified exemption. So this is a video intended to help those. I'm Elaine Lemon. I'm uh, working with the National Young Farmers Coalition to help do this video and help everybody understand how you can use QuickBooks to create this report that's going to be essential to understand your um, exemption. So Kitchen Table Consultants is, um, we're a group of business owners and farmers. Uh, we care a lot about uh, keeping farmers in, bus in business. Um, some of the things that we do, uh, we, I, I'm mostly focused in the financial consulting and the education and training, but we provide services to in all different facets as far as business. We don't consult on production, um, but we do serve farmers and food artisans, um, and we work with nonprofits and also government agencies. These are our four tenets. Uh, I think my favorite is that we walked a mile in your shoes. Uh, basically, that just means like we felt some of the pain and the joys of owning businesses. And so when we work with you, we have a really clear understanding of what you're going through. It helps us to relate and it helps you to understand that we're in it with you and we're there to work side by side. 
Um, and I'm Kara Fraver. I'm with the National Young Farmers Coalition. Um, uh, our coalition unites young farmers and ranchers from around the country to ensure a brighter, more sustainable future for American agriculture. Um, we work, we do that by tackling critical structural and economic barriers that um, prevent motivated young people from building successful businesses. Um, you might be really familiar with a lot of those barriers like land access and access to credit, but one of the barriers um, that we're also dealing with and the one that we're talking about today is about na navigating federal rules and regulations like the Food Safety and Modernization Act. You can read more about um, our coalition at youngfarmers.org and you can read more about FISMA there as well and find um, resources for learning more about uh, food safety. Um, so we are developing this video because we've spent like almost three years uh, working with the local food safety collaborative to help smaller growers understand how the Food Safety Modernization Act or FISMA will impact their businesses. And we've trained like 1,500 farmers and most of the people that we trained are considered qualified exempt. Uh, hopefully if you're watching this video, which is a little advanced, you'll know a bit about FISMA already and you'll understand qualified exemption and you're just checking in to understand how you can use QuickBooks to prove a qualified exemption. But when you're qualified exempt, one of the key things that you'll need to do is to keep records that prove that exemption. Um, so we're going to call that a qualified exempt annual review. Um, so inspections are beginning, inspections for the produce safety rule under FISMA are beginning in some states. Um, and in some of those states, small farmers are beginning to be asked to apply for a qualified exemption or to prove their qualified exemption. So this is a video intended to help those produce farmers who are already using QuickBooks figure out what percentage of their sales go to qualified end users um, and figure out if they're qualified exempt and have all the paperwork ready to prove that exemption. Um, so on that point, there's a number of templates out there. Oh, here, this is a quick slide about qualified exemptions. So hopefully you already have some knowledge of the pretty safety rule, but what is a qualified exemption? It's a little tricky. So uh, this is available in a link uh, connected to this video, so you can kind of walk through that yourself. Um, so that's that resource. Uh, there are also a number of templates out there that help growers compile their average sales numbers to create this qualified exempt annual review. They're not hard to use those templates, you can do them with a pencil and pen, um, but you'll have to pull all of your income records from somewhere else. So maybe you keep those in, um, in Google Docs or in Excel or something like that. Um, or maybe you keep them in QuickBooks, and then you'll have to insert them into this template. So if you, my, my sweetheart, my husband said, um, my sweetheart has a sort of love-hate relationship with QuickBooks, and he was like, there should just be a way to tag all the accounts so it'll spit out this report every year. And I'm not a QuickBooks expert, so I reached out to Elaine, um, and she's going to kind of go through the nitty gritty of how to how to do that today. So the other thing I just want to point out is this is not a beginner video. Um, we talk about FISMA for like eight hours. Um, this isn't that. This is pretty high level. It's for growers who are already using QuickBooks and pretty comfortable with it. And for farmers who already know a bit about the produce safety rule and are just trying to understand how to make this annual review document quickly and as painlessly as possible. So we're gonna to link to a bunch of resources like the templates, like that flow chart, um, so that you have extra background and extra resources. And um, we're trying to make this video as quick and short and to the point as possible. So it might move really fast. And if you need to pause it and go back and rewatch it, do whatever you have to do so that you can kind of follow along with QuickBooks at home. And Elaine is also, made a really nice SOP to go along with this process. So that'll be linked in here as well. Awesome, thank you. Okay, so uh, we're gonna dive right in in QuickBooks. Uh, one of the things to do is to set up your customers so that you can run a customer by detail report. And that's gonna be what gives you your totals. Um, so we need to basically start 
designating which customers go under a parent customer. And that's gonna, you know, you're gonna add indicators for whether that's non-qualified or qualified end user. So this is the dashboard in QuickBooks Online. This is where we're gonna be focusing. We're gonna be talking mostly in terms of the um, QuickBooks Online uh, subscription that's called Essentials. There's also uh, Plus and Advanced, um, and we'll, I'll talk about Plus a little bit and how it differs in customer setup, but I think that most farmers um, of the size that are gonna be needing to do this exercise are gonna be using Essentials, and that's probably the best fit for you. So first thing you wanna do is uh, sidebar in sales, you can go to customers. And then you can see we've already set up parent customers called things like distributors, farmers market, CSA, direct to consumer. So they're, they're generalized um, you know, parent customers. So not only gonna help you with this exemption reporting, but also it's gonna lend uh, itself in terms of understanding your income channels and where you're making the most money. So uh, in the end, it's probably gonna help you with some of your uh, profit and loss reporting and your future plans. Um, some other headers are um, Grocers Direct, um, and then I added some restaurants over 275 miles away because that's one of the, the stipulations in the reporting and restaurants local. Um, I think you could probably pretty easily have this combined as just restaurants if you felt like you didn't, ha either you don't have any that are that far away or that you can easily pull those out when you run a report. Um, so let's look at how you might edit one of those. Uh, first of all, you know, you see the little black arrow over here. There's lots of different um, ways to uh, do activities with each one. You're not going to do much for any parent categories, but um, if we click on distributors and then go if customer, so there's a transaction list over here, but then there's also customer details. This is where you're allowed to edit. Um, but actually, let's go and look at a different customer, one that's um, not a parent, Peter's Peck. So let's imagine for a second that we, um, that we classified Peter Speck under, under distributor by accident and he should have been under farmer's markets. Um, here you, is where you would go to edit and then you've got a screen with lots of different options here and notice all the tabs across the bottom. So this is just the general information you should have in there and you can get as detailed as you want. Um, so here is the drop down after you've chosen sub customer you can the drop down of all the different every every customers in here you want to make sure you ch choose the parent so that's going to be the parent customer and then right here where it says bill with parent you want to make sure you just say bill this customer because um the parents aren't actually customers right they're they're false they're just in order to categorize when you're doing the reporting um so in essentials that's all you would do right you've already created your parent customers just to pop over, this is actually a plus version. This interface is gonna look exactly the same, except for under additional info in plus, you will have this customer type feature where you could add new customer types. And so I've shown here that you can put in a non-qualified and qualified category, uh, which makes it really, really slick for reporting. So, you know, plus is gonna streamline it a bit better, but there's a, there's a higher cost and a bunch of other features that you might not need as a small farmer. So we save that, and then Peter's Peck is under the proper parent category. Okay, so now, um, other thing to note, I think, is that there are um, other sub-customers like home farm store. So say you have a farm stand on your farm, you wanna have that listed as a farmer's market as well, right? So we keep this really general as a parent so we can do specifics down below, but then in the end, if we wanna collapse that and understand just what all of our direct consumer has been, and we have that number. Okay, so now if we move over to the reports. I've added it as a favorite, sales by customer type detail. Um, you would find it down in sales and customers in the reports interface. Um, and you, when you hit the stars, when it adds it as a, um, a favorite. Now, since we are looking at a plus version of QuickBooks, we have the customer type detail. So what you would have to do in, custom, in the QuickBooks Essentials is the sales by customer detail. 
and it's gonna behave the same way. Um, so let's have a look at this report. All right, so you're gonna to wanna to customize this a little bit, right? Cause you're reporting on an annual basis and this is just showing like this month to date. This is just the, you know, the very basic um, template that it will show you. So we need to remember that this is a dummy account, right? This isn't a real QuickBooks account. It's just for our demos that we so often do. So a lot of the dates of our transactions are older. So we're gonna, I'm gonna do a custom and I'm just gonna type in that we're gonna do the year of, 2018. So by customer type, again, because we are in plus, I'm going to hit cash um, so that uh, any, any, if I was doing this real time and you hit accrual, you could have transactions in there that haven't been paid for yet. Um, there is some muddiness around uh, understanding exactly what the time frame parameters are for reporting. And I think that the National Young Farmers Coalition can help you flesh that out a little more. It seems as though um, the guidelines are telling us that it's your discretion, whether you're reporting on things. So say you take CSA prepay, um, and I'll show you a little bit more about that here in the report, but you're receiving that money and it might be in a particular span of time, but you might not have delivered that product yet. So we're not totally certain if it's um, when you receive the cash or when you um, deliver the product, but it appears that it's your discretion, just be consistent. Yeah, so, the rule says it's annual, and then I think the farmers can decide what annual means for them, and if you can check with your inspector to see if they have a specific way they'd like you to do it. Great, thank you. Um, okay, so this is just broken it out in the non-qualified end user and qualified end user. So now I wanna customize this because I'd like to see a little bit more. So when I look at rows and columns, um, I wanna change columns. I wanna add customer. Um, and I might wanna move these around a little bit. I might wanna take some of this away. Like I don't need a memo. Um, I probably don't need a number. Price is good, amount's good, balance, yeah. I want this customer up here though, right by the date. Okay, let's see what that looks like. Something's not right here, Kara. I have to edit this. Junior Summer 2018, where are they all? I'm gonna pause the recording, something's up. Okay, so now we save this and it's time to go look at the reports. So I've already added a sales by customer detail report in QuickBooks Plus. It's gonna say sales by customer type detail because it allows for that customer type designation. Um, so in essentials, just assume that you'll see only customer detail. Um, so we click on that. And then you're gonna to wanna to customize this. This is an annual report. Um, this is also a dummy account. So uh, we have got older transactions in here. So we're gonna do the year of 2018. Just the full calendar year for us. Um, and then we are gonna group by customer type. Run report. So when I look at this, I see we don't quite have enough information. Like I wanna see those customers and I wanna see the parent, cat the parent customers that we've added. So you, then you go over to customize and down here in rows and columns, this has it grouped by customer type, which is fine and plus, but if you wanna change those columns, then it shows you all the columns that are selected automatically and other ones that you can add. So I wanna create, I wanna add the customer in there and it's just gonna pop it here in the bottom. I also want it to be up here so it's a little more readable. I don't need a number, I don't need a memo and description, so that's gonna make our report a little easier to read. So let's run it again. There we go, so our sales are starting in May for 2018. 
Um, and then for the, you know, the non-qualified end user, it's a much shorter list with a total here. And then the qualified end user, we've got much longer list. Now, you can see that the parent categories are actually, um, they're written as a, a, a long uh, string of, of all the details. So the parent is here as before the colon and then the specifics. So if you wanted to see this sorted, you would export to Excel and you could sort by customer um, and it would make it really easy to see what you're, what you're making from each venue. Um, so if you, if you don't need to sort or change anything, if you don't need to pull out um, any funds that uh, you feel don't belong, you can stop here. You can just use these totals. So your non-qualified is that total and scrolling to the bottom, your qualified end user is this 68,595, right? And then it totals up both for you. Uh, if you do need to make changes, you would then export to Excel because it's easy to sort by column. So you just hit that. And then I do have the export all ready to go. We can look at that. Um, and I have an example of what you need to do if you want to pull out money from product that hasn't been delivered yet, like a CSA prepay. Okay. So this is what the report would look like in Excel after you've exported that and opened it up. Um, so it's just got uh, everybody listed in here and I, it's still listed by date in here. That's the, the chronology. But if you wanted to sort a range, you know, you could select all of this and then sort by column C and it's gonna, you know, put all of your customers in the order of their name instead of the chronology. And then down below here, I'll show you an example. I've pulled out CSA prepay for what would be, it's basically they're paying for winter CSA. Um, and so you'll have to decide whether you wanna include this in the qualified end user or not. And Kara, if you wanna read that rule um, so that farmers understand what, you know, that literally is being said and what your choices are, that would be great. Yeah, um, so the rule, I don't have the language right here, but the rule technically says that it needs to be an annual review, and it doesn't tell you whether that's from the, your date of first sales or the first day of the year or whatever. You just need to be consistent. So with these liabilities for winter CSA sales, if you're going to pull them out one year and make sure that... Um, that you are accepting the payment in QuickBooks at the in the same calendar year that it is delivered or in the same annual time period that the vegetables are delivered, that's fine. You just wanna keep it the same for every year. And I, I think it's important to also note that it might be useful to check in with your inspector who are, or whoever's asking for this paperwork to see if they have strict rules about how they want you, what they want you to consider annual. And you are gonna to need to do this for three years because it's a, because um, the annual review is using an average of your previous three years sales. So we're just showing you how to do it for one year, but then you'd have to do it for the three years to take an average. Right, exactly, thank you, yes. Um, all right, so I wanna talk a little bit about how you would have to handle non-food items. So if you have merchandise or flowers or, um, you know, something that you're, you're some the farm product that, um, or not really a farm product, some product that you're reselling that, um, that wouldn't count as a food item. So, you know, if you're reselling uh, apples, that still counts as a qualified end user if it's going, if it falls in the category, you still count that as income in your exemption. So if you're selling tote bags and flowers, you're gonna to wanna to pull that product out of this total income of the qualified end user. So say you've got a qualified end user of um, your home farm market, but some of those sales are for your tote bags or t-shirts. Uh, you're gonna to wanna to make sure that you have proper product and income accounts set up in QuickBooks so that you could run a report to see the total income for that year period and the three year period so that you can then pull that total out of your qualified end user total. So I would recommend having a category in your charter accounts that's labeled something like non-food income um, or a merchandise income. That way, you know, when you create an invoice, if you've got 
food items and um, you know merchandise that you can you can then assign that product to an income account. You'll have to run a, a report on the income and then do a calculation in a spreadsheet. Um, it should be pretty straightforward if you're familiar with QuickBooks. Um, let's see, other things to consider. Creating sales receipts for your farmer's markets and your CSAs. I can show you quickly how to do that. Um, because you're gonna wanna make sure that you uh, are tracking that income. If you just receive a deposit from your bank feed and you assign that uh, customer, it's possible that it won't actually end up in this report, this customer detail report. So if we go up to the plus sign, sales receipt. Nice and slow. <laughs> Here's where you would choose your customer. And you can see even the parent categories are here. So you wanna be careful not to select just farmer's markets ESA, right? You wanna choose the actual farmer's market. So let's say it's the home farm store. Um, and we'll say it was um, June of this year. Uh, payment method, you know, sometimes you can, you can skip this if it's not gonna be crucial for you. As far as reporting goes, it doesn't really matter. Um, and then deposit two. I like to put in undeposited funds to start because then when you pull in your bank feed, it will automatically match to it. Now you want to make sure that the that the sales receipt's gonna exactly match the deposit. So in the event that you are receiving square at your home farm market and you wanted to record that, you'll have to do a sales receipt that's for cash and checks, and then do a separate sales receipt that's for square. So whatever money you received for square. You would put in the total and you would probably call it um, like farm something very general markets farm grown product right and then you would put in say it's a hundred bucks hopefully it's a lot more than that and then you'd have to have a, a product that's called um, square fee right so we've added that in and the tricky part here is being sure that when you create that product called square fee that you would sign it to the expense account that's fees for transactions, right? Some people have it just labeled square fees, some people have it, you know, merchant transaction fee. Um, regardless, you wanna make sure it's included as an operating cost. And then um, you do a negative three here, and then it drops it down to the actual deposit. So the deposit that's coming into the bank will say $97. When you send this to undeposited funds uh, and you just pull in your bank feed, they will automatically match, right? As long as there wasn't like some sort of keying area. Era, error. <laughs> okay, so I'm just gonna save and close. And then um, creating invoices. You know, ideally you're gonna create an invoice for every customer that is not like a farmer's market type thing or not a CSA member, right? You're gonna create invoices for your restaurants, your other wholesale customers. Um, you wanna make sure that these are really accurate so that when it comes down to reporting, you don't have to wade through and, and make all kinds of corrections. So say notes, we wanna do um, an invoice for them. And there's all kinds of detail, but it's very similar to the sales receipt. You will choose, I mean, this is gonna be an itemized list of the products, right? And then the totals associated with them. And again, whatever farm grown products are going, you know, along with this order should be assigned to the income account farm grown product. Um, if for some reason Nolts wants to buy uh, your t-shirts wholesale and resell them, that's going to have to be a line item that's like a non-food, right? And then that will get assigned to the non-food income account. All right. A lot of details, but it's doable. Okay. So last one, but I'll take it. So I'll let you look at this report again while we keep talking about what's next. Because um, I think there's some value in being able to see this. Um, I think we've just about covered most of, of this. Kara, would you like to actually uh, have me pull up the template so they can see it? In the yeah. Okay. One second. Yeah, and we can maybe compare those two. Yeah. 
So with this, this is then going to spit out your, uh, your total for the qualified end user shown right there, 57,000 and some. And so you would take that amount and plug it into the template that is provided. The link will be in the links to this video. Um, so that would probably be, that would probably be year three. Um, whoops. Oh, sorry. It's okay. Did it disappear? There we go. Yeah, there we go. So that would probably be your year, year three. Oh, here. So you would look, if you, it's hard to see them both at the same time, but you would, you, this is actually asking for your total food sales. So you would enter your total food sales number um, and you get all, those for all three years. You'd make an average of them. And then you would have at the bottom, the average sales sold to qualified end users. Um, to get the percentage that sold to qualified end users. So that's pretty, that should be pretty straightforward. Um, obviously you can use your, you can use Excel to give you the percentage itself. And in this template, it's asking you to average uh, your past three years of food sales and then your three years, your average of your three years of qualified end users. So like a little bit, um, I think how you do the average is a little bit different, but in any case, uh, in, on most farms, it's going to not make much of a difference. So that this is like how you plug in those numbers. Um, this isn't a require. This template isn't exactly the requirement. So it might be that someone is happy to just get the printout um, from QuickBooks of the that um report so if you had three of those one for 2018 one for 2017 one for 2016 you might be able to just hand that over to your inspector but i think because this template is the um probably the most commonly used template out there then if you just plug it in it might might make that the job of working with the inspector a little bit easier easier for them easier for you um does that does that pretty much cover that part? Oh, there's one thing I would love to add in um, is that, so just a quick, quick details on what might happen. Um, so it might be that your inspector or someone from the Department of Ag or your inspecting body will call and say, hey, I'm with the Department of Ag and I wanna schedule a FISMA inspection. And then in that instance, you can say, hey, I'm qualified exempt and I have all my annual review paperwork to prove that. Uh, is there any specific template you want me to use or do you just want me to send you the one I have? Um, we're hearing also that some states are making sort of an application process so they know which farmers are qualified exempt and which ones aren't. Um, this is also important to say that you should be doing this process every year. You might wanna do it you know, in the, in the winter or at the um, beginning of the year. So you just kind of have it all taken care of for the previous year, um, sort of end of your paperworking, um, and that it should be signed and dated. So you should do that even if no one has called you, um, even if nobody's asking, you should just keep that stuff on hand. Um, you can probably email or fax or mail them this paperwork so they won't come and visit you, but um, while that could be much less stressful than having somebody come out and visit, there are some states uh, that may want to send your state agency um, out to look at the paperwork because anything, any paperwork that they collect is subject to the Freedom of Information Act or FOIA. So that would just mean that um, any of the info you provided could be requested or seen by somebody from the general public. So uh, it might be that your state inspector would be happier to just come out to your farm, look over the paperwork, not take it with them because they don't want to have those sales records um, on record to be accessible through the Freedom of Information Act. Um, that might not really matter to you, but it might be the way that your state is doing it. Um, so it's just good to understand like what's the process that your state is going through uh, to review those annual review documents. 
Um, and it is imp also important to say if they come to inspect your annual review, qualified exemption annual review paperwork, they should not be inspecting other parts of your farm. So they should just be looking over that paperwork, making sure it's all in order. Um, you are technically supposed to have sales receipts for all of that stuff. I think this QuickBooks report would be, should be sufficient for that. Um, but that's kind of background. Just to spend a quick moment to describe what is a qualified end user, because um, hopefully we go through that pretty clearly in other documents, but just because it's like the key part of what we're talking about today, I should say that a qualified end user can be the actual consumer of that food. So if I sell a pint of cherry tomatoes to Elaine, she's the consumer of the food, um, that is always going to be a qualified end user, even if I sell it to her over the internet and she lives in California and I live in New York. Um, other consumers of the food that are, those are always going to be an individual, not a business. So examples can be CSA, farmers markets, farm stands, online sales, directly through a produce auction. All of that is considered a qualified end user. A local restaurant is considered a qualified end user. Local is less than 275 miles or within the same state or within the same um, Native American reservation. It can be a local retail food establishment. So that could be a grocery store that buys directly from the farmer. It could be another food stand, farm stand. It could be a farmer run co-op grocery, um, like a natural food store. Those are all retail food establishments. And again, as long as they're within 275 miles or in the same state or the same Indian reservation, they count as a qualified end user. Um, what is not qualified end users are wholesalers or any sort of other aggregator, even some food hubs or aggregated CSAs are going to be outside of a qualified end user. So if you're selling to someone and then if you're selling to someone, they're kind of gathering up all that food and then redistributing it, that is usually not a qualified end user. The end. Okay. Awesome. All right, so I'm just going to leave some lists of the qualified end users up here. Okay, um, great. So I just want to talk briefly about um, some of the best practices that we've gone over. Um, obviously, you need to have a, like a lot of vigilance with your customer detail entry. So what Kara was just talking about, you want to make sure that you very carefully categorize your customers at the front end of this process. Um, Any time in QuickBooks that you are more diligent and spend uh, more time in the beginning, it makes the end very smooth, so there's less headaches. Um, you want to be really careful about the report customization too. Um, so you could save that customization, that demo that I showed you, um, and you just want to make sure that you've got it exactly the way you want it so that it's a repeatable system for you and you don't have to go back and keep messing with it. You'll always have to change the date range for a new report. Um, the invoicing. Uh, we're going to include a couple steps for the best practices in the SOP that Kara mentioned just to make sure that um, you know you guys have some reference at your fingertips to make sure that that's getting done properly. Um, and then remember if there's no invoice, uh, for example for a farmer's market or um, some direct to consumer sale, you want to make sure to create a sales receipt for that. Um, make sure you get your products assigned to the right income accounts and any fees assigned to the right expense accounts. Um, and that's about it. I mean, some final thoughts that I have, I think, for you guys would be if you are CSA farms and you collect prepay, um, it really makes sense, even though you're actually receiving that cash, to assign it as uh, an increase in a liability because you haven't delivered that product yet. And in order to make it really detailed for you in terms of monthly reporting and monthly budgeting, if you have that prepay sitting as a liability on your balance sheet, you can do a monthly journal entry that moves it from the liability to the income account so that every month you'll see a pretty direct lineup of what it costs you to deliver that exact product. Uh, and that's where the budgeting can get really exciting because then you start to see, you know, the amount of time and labor and other packaging and other expenses that went into each, each week or month of sales, those, those sales are then lined up properly and not looking like one big chunk in February. So um, we're going to put some details about that in the SOP as well. And then let me just move back over to our slides and we can 
wrap it up here. Okay, so that wraps it up for us. This is my contact information. If you need a little help with QuickBooks, I'm happy to lend a hand. Um, we do a, quite a bit of pro bono work at KTC, especially for small farmers who are just getting used to it. We'd like to see you guys succeed. Um, and I get a huge kick out of um, seeing you guys light up when you have success in QuickBooks. So I really appreciate being a part of this. And um, you know, I, I love and admire National Young Farmers Coalition so much, having been a farmer myself for 15 years. So thank you, Kara, for letting me be a part of this with you today. Thank you. Thanks for walking us through um, through all that quick book. So let us know if this is helpful. Please follow up if you watch this and you have lingering questions. Um, we that's our all push to Elaine. So she's kind of the QuickBooks quiz, but I can talk about a lot about FISMA. So uh, thanks so much for watching this. Take care. Thanks, guys.